Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here, back again with the sixth installment of this vainglorious attempt of mine at immortality, introducing the history of tea. On behalf of everyone here at the Tea History Podcast, welcome back. Well, we left off just as I was beginning to introduce the Chamagu Dao, the ancient tea horse road. At the exact same time that the earliest development of the tea horse road was ramping up, one of the great countries and cultures of Asia was bellying up at the bar, sipping away at the delights and pleasures of Chinese culture. For Japan, India was too far away, but China was conveniently located just across the East China Sea. That's where the Japanese went to learn the customs of China, see the sights, check out the Buddhist temples, and bring everything of use back to Japan, where it was reverse-engineered, modified to suit local tastes and sensibilities, and then these threads were woven into the ever-emerging Japanese fabric. The Japanese during the Tang Dynasty came for the Buddhism, but they went back to Japan with plenty of tea also, and a few other things. But those two, Buddhism and tea, those two valuable acquisitions came at the same time. And as I mentioned, in the case of Zen Buddhism, they became one. This wasn't the first time these two great nations and peoples got to see each other up close. China and Japan first met back in 57 CE, Eastern Han, the time of Emperor Guangwu. But things really began to heat up during the Sui. And these were the times of the Kentoshi, or Tiantangshi, of the 7th to 9th centuries. Between 607 and 838, Japan sent 19 embassies to China. Let me introduce Saicho. He came to China late in the Tang Dynasty, around 803-804, during De Zong's reign. Now, during his time in China, Saicho soaked up all the culture and learning that he could humanly take in. This is right at the early part of the Heian era during the reign of Japanese Emperor Saga, 809 to 823. And in the West, this was also the exact time Charlemagne reigned and founded the Carolingian Empire. Saicho became a monk at the age of 14. He was outstanding in every way, and in his 20s, retreated to Mount Hiei outside of Kyoto to continue his Buddhist studies and devotions. And he developed quite a following there, and those even vaguely familiar with Japan, will know Mount Hiei is where the Enryakuji is located, one of the world's great temples, established by Saicho himself in 788. Saicho had received a directive from no less a person than the emperor of Japan, who told him to go travel around China and bring back as many Buddhist texts as possible. And while he was at it, create friendly relations with the Tang Empire, too. So with regard to Buddhism, Saicho was specifically tasked with studying the Tiantai sect of Buddhism. This is one that was purely homegrown in China and didn't get transplanted from India. You probably heard of the famous Lotus Sutra. Well, that's associated with this particular sect. So Saicho was asked to study their teachings as much as possible. Saicho did as he was told, and eight months after arriving, he headed back to Tsushima on a vessel that sailed from Ningbo. Saicho brought some tea seeds back with him that he had acquired on this mission and planted them in Sakamoto Village in Omi Prefecture on the slopes of Mount Hiei. And this original tea garden is said to still exist in Ikegami. It was right after Saicho returned from China that he made tea for Emperor Saga, and received imperial support in promoting tea drinking and cultivation. Tea, as it was in its current unrefined brick form in the Tang, didn't particularly go down too well with the Japanese market or nobility. It didn't catch fire in Japan during this Tang period. But seeds were transported, and trees take time to grow. So later on, during the Kamakura period, 1185 to 1392, the timing and the technology of tea making would be all ready to conquer Japan. So we'll talk about Eisai when we get to the Song period. As we saw following the classic of tea, this beverage fully penetrated the mass market during the Tang. And this penetration into the daily lives of most all Chinese 
would be even greater during the Song. But now, in the 8th and 9th centuries, the word had gotten out and everybody was drinking tea. The government again saw an opportunity and created a whole arm of the administration to deal with a tea tax. After the salt and steel tax, tea brought in the greatest amount of revenue for the Tang treasury. The Dezong emperor tried taxing tea first, unsuccessfully, in 780, when Lu Yu published the Cha Jing and tea sales started to get real hot. This initial tea tax was repealed for a while due to the politics of the time not being quite right. But as soon as the time was more politically feasible, the emperor put it in place again in 793. Tea cultivation made a lot of progress during the Tang Dynasty. They figured out during the Tang that tea trees and plants love shade. This tipped farmers off to plant the tea bushes in the shadiest places along the northern slopes of the hills and mountains. As more and more knowledge about tea cultivation accumulated, and with domestic and overseas demand growing like it was, it put even further incentive on farmers to leave Sichuan and begin heading east along the Yangtze River Valley to plant new tea gardens there. A lot of the most legendary tea gardens out east began this way. The manufacturing and packaging process for brick tea had been further advanced during the Tang. They came up with new ways to mold these tea bricks and make them easier to transport and stay fresh along the way. When these human pack animals of the Tang era were hauling this brick tea on their sturdy backs through the dangerous mountain passes of the Himalayas, tea still had seven centuries to go yet before European people have their first sip. The tea culture early on was developed around the imperial court, with the emperor, of course, at the center of it all. And after new ways to drink it in Chang'an, Luoyang, Kaifeng, or Beijing were thought up, this new way of preparing the tea or serving the tea, or some new aspect of tea culture, instantly became fashionable. So you can say, during the Tang, tea really went up and down market. Both the masses and the nobles, for the first time in history, were mutually enjoying tea. And tea, as an art as fashion, in literature, as a philosophy, all of this finally came together in the tongue. Tea had evolved into a powerful muse that inspired unknown numbers of masterpieces in art and literature that have survived throughout the ages. Also around this time, in the early 800s, there lived a man of letters named Lu Tong, Lu Yu, of course, is the better known of the two because of the Cha Jing, but Lu Tong is a very close second place with his great body of work in Tang poetry in general and for his famous tea poems, most notable Qi Wan Cha, or Seven Bowls of Tea in particular. Lu Tong's poem is considered the definitive Tang Dynasty tea poem. Not only was it popular in China, but in Japan as well. And there were a lot of tea poems that came out of that golden era. Lu Tong was famous for many things. Writing under the pen name of Yu Chuanzi, he became renowned for his poems and his love of and expertise in all things tea. He was also known for his wisdom and good sense, as well as for his several eccentricities, mostly manifested in his reclusive lifestyle. All these facets of his life combined into one single human unit made Lu Tong quite an endearing Tang Dynasty personage. He lived this hermit-like existence out in this beautiful mountain in Henan, not far from Shaolin Temple. He came for money, so Lu Tong never had to worry about where his next bowl of kanji was coming from. Lu Tong lived an idyllic, scholarly life in every way. He drank tea all day long, and important people often came to seek his counsel. Lu Tong was a young man when Lu Yu's blockbuster came out. Their two lives had 14 years of overlap when both an aged Lu Yu and a young Lu Tong were living. Lu Tong was totally uncorrupted by money and politics. Despite all the attempts by government officials to recruit him, he always said that life wasn't for him. He was an ardent Taoist and followed the Tao in all ways. He was incorruptible. Nobody could buy him. But Lu Tong could be tempted with the right tea. He was credited with saying, quote, I care not a bit for immortal life, 
but only for the taste of tea. End quote. I told you the tribute tea system really took off during the Tang emperors. And honestly, how much could the emperor drink? So all these fantastic teas, finest in all the land, a lot of product trickled down to those who hung around the imperial palace. Lu Tong knew one such guy, and one day this person, someone who had access to the emperor himself, came calling on Lu Tong and brought him a very special gift that had been handed to him before by the emperor himself. So he was sort of re-gifting this tea that had come direct from the emperor's own stash. And this official had now come down to the Lake Tai area in Jiangsu. It was now giving this tea to Lu Tong. Now later on in the series, we'll look at many of these tribute teas. There's so many of them. But this one in particular, Yang Xian Zi Sun Cha. <laughs> this one was not easy to get your hands on. At least, not the quality that went to the Imperial Palace in Chang'an. This Zisun, or purple bamboo tea, was, I read, the first true tribute tea. The operation to produce this tea began in 770, the Tang Daizong Emperor's time. Yang Xian tea came from Mount Guju, near the Lake Tai area. The famous lake in China, surrounded by the cities of Suzhou, Huzhou, Changxing, Yixing, and Wuxi, Yangxian was the former name of what we know today as the city of Yixing. And we'll talk about their tea wear later on in another episode. This Yangxian tea was one of the earliest teas of the spring season to be picked. There was an old saying that went, quote, The hundred plants dare not bloom until the emperor had the first taste of Yangxian tea. End quote. The emperor sent his own people down to Jiangsu to personally oversee the harvesting, the packaging, and to supervise the entire operation and ensure the integrity of the product that ultimately got transported up to Chang'an met with his satisfaction. The shipment had to arrive and be ready to drink before the Qingming holiday in early April. This wasn't just some ordinary tribute tea. When Lu Tong copped a gander at this generous gift of Yang Xian Zi Sun Cha, he really was beholding the Holy Grail for any Cha Ren or tea person like himself. And not just the tea, the water too that flowed from nearby Jinsha Spring, that too had to accompany the tea leaves. In order to extract the optimum tea drinking experience, the best and purest flavor, the finest aroma, the Yang Xian Zi Sun Cha had to be drunk with Jinsha spring water. I'm not kidding you. They filled containers with water from the Jinsha spring and transported it all the way up to Chang'an. 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. But if you lived in the area of Huzhou or Yixing, you could have it every day. You can buy this tea today. A lot of tea shops, both brick and mortar and online, sell it. I don't know about the... Uh, Jin Sha water, though. The way you can buy it today doesn't look at all like it did during the Tang. As we'll see over the next episodes, tea never stopped evolving. In Lu Tong's time and the Tang, this tea came in small, convenient, compressed cakes. It wasn't found in its present loose leaf form until the Ming Dynasty. So Lu Tong wrote this poem. It was written in the form of a letter of appreciation to his friend up at the palace, who had been so kind as to give him a gift fit for an emperor. I'm sure Lu Tong appreciated it a lot more than his majesty did. So he wrote this poem, and I'll just read the most famous part, where he speaks about the seven bowls of tea he pours for himself after he has shut himself in and was all alone in his tea version of his smoking spot. Then he enjoyed this tea. I'll read both the English translation and what Lu Tong actually wrote. The first bowl moistens my lips and throat. Yi Wan Ho Wen Run the second bowl breaks my loneliness. Arwan Pogu Mun. The third bowl searches my barren entrails, but to find therein some five thousand scrolls. Sanwan Soku Chang Weiyo Wen Zi Wu Qian Juan. The fourth bowl raises a slight perspiration. Siwan Fa Qing Han. And all life's inequities pass out through my pores. Ping Sheng. Bu Ping Shi, Jin Xiang, Mao Kong San. The fifth bowl purifies my flesh and bones. Wu Wan, Ji Gu Qing. 
The sixth bowl calls me to the immortals. Liu Wan, Tong Xian Ling. The seventh bowl could not be drunk. Qi Wan, Chi Bu De Ye. Only the breath of the cool wind raises in my sleeves. Wei Jue Liang Ye, Xi Xi, Qing Feng Sheng. Where is Peng Lai Island? Yu Chuan Zi wishes to ride on this sweet breeze and go back. Peng Lai Shan Zai He Chu. Yu Chuan Zi Cheng Zi Qing Feng Yu Gui Qu. Lu Tong, everyone. Yeah, tea had come a long way since the Bronze Age, but it still had plenty more refinement and improvement to go yet. By Lu Tong's time in the Tang Dynasty, early ninth century, tea took on a whole new importance. Tea had reached the point in scale and economics where most everyone could afford it. Not everyone got to enjoy the same quality or drink from the same tea wear, but well, that's the same wherever you go. Quality aside, tea had become something that everyone throughout society began to demand on a daily basis, and I'm not talking once per day either. People will say the same or similar things about their coffee. Coffee and tea. Both offer great pleasures, inspiration, and for many, an extra stage of rocket fuel to power them through the day or through a meeting. Everyone had access to tea. It was more dear to some than to others, but it was now a part of daily life in China. And as I mentioned at the outset, the border people incorporated tea into their daily life too. And if you had tea, no matter how poor you were, you had to have some sort of tea set to make it. Pour it and drink it. Well, you just need a charcoal stove, some sort of pot, and two cups. But this would hardly suffice if you were someone who drank tea as more than just a thirst quencher. You needed some tea-specific utensils to do it all upright. That's how the whole teaware industry was created in China. And out of this necessity, of course, came great innovations that inspired other porcelain treasures. During the Tang Dynasty, there was a type of porcelain ware called yue ware, yue qi. Technically, it was a stone ware. It came from yue zhou, hence its name. Yue zhou would be near present-day Shaoxing, just a little east of Hangzhou. The earliest days of yue ware go back to the later Han. The quality and design of the ceramics coming out of those kilns reached their height during the Tang, and prior to the Tang, yue ware had. Quite a following regionally, but in the Tang, it became a national brand. And I think I mentioned last episode, Lu Yu, yeah, he preferred Yue Wear as well. Yue Wear was the most common tea wear in China. Then it's recognizable by its yellowish or bluish green color. There was even a color of Yue Wear reserved for the emperor called Mi Se, which translates to secret color. The recipe for this glaze was a state secret. Nothing was more precious than jade back then. So this yue ware and its celadon glaze, with its jade look to it, was most prized. You recall from that Lu Yu episode, the tea saint considered yue ware superior to its rival product, Xing ware. For drinking tea, yue ware was the old established China ware of the masses who could afford to use China ware. Especially by the ninth century, this was already not a small number. Xing ware, despite its failure to win over Lu Yu, still took the Tang Dynasty by storm. The characteristic thing about Xing ware was its whiteness, all white, very delicate looking. The tea looks great in the cup, and you can get a better appreciation of the tea's color in Xing ware. In choosing the color of the tea ware, it was always an important consideration that the cup provided a pleasing complement to the color of the tea you were drinking. There are a lot of differences in a tea's color from brew to brew and leaf to leaf, and Xingware really brought it out. This kind of porcelain was also called whiteware. Xingware was an innovation of the north, around Hebei, in the heartland where Chinese civilization began. Yueware came from the south, south of the Yangtze. When Western people figure out what tea is in the 17th century, it's also going to spawn a whole global industry of porcelain ware. I know this sounds incredible to believe, but Europeans didn't figure out how to make porcelain until the early 18th century. Johann Friedrich Bertiger, his shop was in Mason, not far from Dresden. Bertiger figured out how to do it, and up until his time, when he figured it out in 1705, porcelain was 
right up there with silver and gold as far as precious objects went. It was called white gold. So in the time of Lu Yu and Lu Tong, the porcelain secret was still safe for another nine centuries. And trust me, when Bertiger discovered how to make porcelain, he kept it under wraps too. Passionately so. The opening of the Grand Canal and the Sway and other transport links caused a massive network of trade to develop. And with this, tea and tea culture was able to make its way from the southwest and to the east and then to the north much more easily. The awareness of tea, it went in all directions. We saw Princess Wenchong and how this marriage alliance her uncle, the Taizong Emperor, made with the King of Tibet brought tea, Buddhism, and Chinese culture to that part of Asia. And as a direct result of this interaction, the Cha Ma Gu Dao, the ancient tea horse route that would become so developed and institutionalized in the Song, came into being. And countless Heavy loads of brick tea were carried through these dangerous mountain passes by mules and human mules. This was a rough trade, and they probably didn't have a union back then. This tea brought to Tibet and other places gave a nice boost to the nutritional well-being of the Zhang, Qiang, and other ethnic peoples of the Himalayas. And we closed with Lu Tong, one of the great characters from the Tang Dynasty in his poem, Chi Wan Cha, Seven Bowls of Tea. Even though the Tang was a brick tea world, they still made some good stuff. In this episode, imperial tribute teas were also mentioned, and from the introduction of Lu Tong, you could see how special and refined these teas were, and still are. Go to any online tea vendor selling China loose leaf tea, These same tribute teas are still around, and you could buy them. And on a cup-per-cup basis, very affordable to all. So you could see from Lu Tong's poem what tea started to mean to some people for the first time. Not just a medicine anymore. In the Tang, it became the drink that we know and love in our day. Something to savor, something to bring calm, reflection, focus, and inspiration. A beverage that creates a bond between humans and nature. Throughout the Tang, the periods of disunity, the Yuan, and into the Ming, all those areas from Tibet, Qinghai, Xinjiang, Central Asia, and into Mongolia, people immediately took to tea. The dating period was very quick and went straight to marriage. Wherever tea was beheld and tasted, it was always, in these lands bordering China, love at first sight. Well, into the Ming and Qing dynasties, the same thing is going to happen. Only this time, it's not just the border regions surrounding China. It's the whole rest of the world. And global tea mania will be no less great than it was in Lhasa, going back to Princess Wencheng's time. And part of this great story is that by the 17th and 18th centuries, humankind had developed much better modes of transport and logistics than the tea horse road. So I leave you with that to mull over in anticipation of episodes yet to come. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off once again from Los Angeles, California, cordially inviting you to consider joining me next time for another wholly satisfying episode of the Tea History Podcast. <laughs>